Well, good morning. All right. Well, God is good and all the time. All right. Well, I'm very excited. Uh, the opportunity today to, to share with you uh, for, from the Word of God. And, and um, this, if you'd, uh, before we begin, though, will you open a prayer with me this morning? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, uh, Lord, for just an opportunity to gather and worship and to uh, opportunities to gather in fellowship and, and to draw all close to you. Lord, I ask that you speak to our hearts this morning. You are so good and gracious, Father, and I ask that you just uh, guide us and direct us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning I'm going to share with you on discerning God's will. Or how do you determine God's will for your life? Now, as we get into this, this conversation, I want to address three things. First is this, is that uh, there, there's really three types of wills. There's, there's a sovereign will of God, there's the moral will of God, and then the individual will of God. See, the sovereign will of God is, is, is God's overall will. It is His will that uh, nothing surprises Him. Nothing happens that catches Him off guard. That, that ultimately God is in control of all things. The second is His moral will. That what is right and what is wrong. What He has laid before us in His Word. And the third is his individual will or his revealed will. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. The, the will of God that, that we often ask ourselves this question that says, well, God, what do you want me to do? You guys ever asked yourself that question before? You ever asked God, what do you want me to do? And it could be, God, where, who, who should I marry? Where should I live? Well, what city should I go to? Uh, what college should I attend? Or, or what job should I apply for? What do you want me to do for my career path? We often ask ourselves these questions. We ask God this question is, what is it that you want me to do? I remember as a junior in high school, I looked forward to it because you're, you're an upperclassman, but you don't have all the responsibility of being a senior, you know, because a senior, you have, to, you have to know everything. You have to know where you're going to school. You got to know what you're going to study, what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Because when you walk down that, that, that aisle on ceremony, uh, graduation day, they announce your name. David Barnett, graduating from Centerville High School today. He will plan to attend such and such university and he's going to be such and such. And two years later, when you're back in your community and the folks say, well, why aren't you doing that? You've got to give answer. I know for me, I was along that journey. When I was, uh, when I was young, when I was at uh, grade school, through junior high, into my early years, I, for me, I wanted to, to be a choir director. I love music. That's what I wanted to do. When I was 16, God began to transform my heart, my desires. And, and, uh, and I fought it. I, I knew it. I knew that God had called me into the ministry, but I fought it. And, and so um, I, I entered school uh, as a music major. And before I even start put my first foot on campus, I changed my major. <laughs> I changed it three times. <laughs> And, uh, and, and I don't know why, I added minors, and, and ultimately, I still didn't graduate with what I had originally declared. No, I think it was my fifth major I finally ended with, and, and, um, and that's okay. God began to, to begin to work on me. I, I would start on one path, and then it would kind of redirect. And I learned over the time that the more decisions I made, the more incapable I was making good decisions. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that adage that says, no matter what you do, God's got my back. Well, the problem with that is the wrong person's leading. And it took time for, for me to, to realize and to submit that, God, you do have a greater plan for my life, a, a plan that I can't even fathom, and I'm just trying to work this out one day at a time. And the older I get, I'm still trying to work it out one day at a time. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to share a passage, one that we're all very familiar with. It's Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And as we... Try to answer that question this morning is how do, do I determine the will of God, discern God's will for my life? We're going to look at several passages and, and we're going to talk about two main points into the, to the final third. There's this old story uh, that I learned recently, and it talks about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, uh, he was on the road, uh, he was president, he was on, on the road, and on a Sunday morning he visited this church. And in this church was this young pastor, and he was so excited to have uh, President Lincoln in his church. And so he spoke with extra boldness and courage and emphasized certain points just to get, you know, to, to get his, his, his message across. And, and when the message was done, he had the opportunity to speak with President Lincoln. And he asked him, he said, sir, can I ask you, how did I do? And President Lincoln said, well, you spoke with courage and boldness, and you emphasized your points to get your message across. But you didn't ask me to do anything. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to do some things. 
And, and, and you can take notes as you go along. But in this passage, it says this. It says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Maybe your translation doesn't say calamity. Maybe it says welfare. Maybe it says prosper. Maybe it says peace. See, this type of welfare, this type of prosperity, isn't this monetary prosperity that you hear churches speak about all across the country, that God wants you to be rich and wealthy and, and to have everything that your heart desires. You just got to give more and more. In fact, that's not what he's talking about at all. The words welfare, the words prosper, the words uh, peace, all refer back to the word of shalom. He notes this incredible peace in our lives that really is indescribable. So what he says is the plans I have for you are plans of peace. Not fear, not suffering, not calamity, but plans of safety. Plans to give you future, plans to give you a hope. So we begin with that. Understand that God's plan for our lives is a plan of, of indescribable peace, a plan of shalom. The details we'll get into. But it's part of our foundation. Now Paul continues this thought on God's will in Romans 12, chapter, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And he says this, he says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. See, God's plan for us is that of peace and safety. And His will, His, His plan for us is, is good and pleasing. It's perfect. In this text, the word good, God's plan for your life is good. And so much so that, that nothing from God is bad. Everything from God is good. But it's also beneficial. In Philippians, Paul tells us that we do work to fulfill God's purpose, God's will. His will for our lives is to be good. It is to be beneficial to His purpose. And His purpose is to expand the kingdom of God. It's so that everyone shall hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and come to a saving knowledge of that message of that promise of life. So God's will for your life is good, is that it is to benefit His purpose. God's will is acceptable or pleasing. In other words, it's enjoyment, that when you're in the midst of God's will, you will enjoy it, that you will be happy doing what it is that you're doing. John MacArthur shares a story of a friend of his by the name of Marty. Marty was a, uh, he, he was a Christian, he was Jewish, a heritage, and, and uh, he spoke French. And he was talking with John MacArthur one day, and, and he said, Pastor John, he said, uh, you know, I speak French and I have a heart for my people, and, 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 and I think the you know, best thing for me to do would just be move to Paris and, and to share the gospel with them. But the, the idea of applying for the mission boards and raising support and going through the whole process, is, it's so intimidating. It'll take so long that I feel like I'm just wasting time. I don't know what to do. And John MacArthur told him, he said, Marty, just prepare to move. So don't worry about that. So the church began to, uh, to, to raise the support and, and began to, to get the word out that Marty was, wanted to go into the mission field, that he wanted to use his gifts and his passions and his burdens. And it wasn't a year later that Marty was reaching out to the French-speaking Jews of Montreal, Canada. You see, Marty had the right idea. God had a different city in mind. See, he was doing the things that he was gifted at doing, the things that he was excited about doing, that, that, something that gave him uh, pleasure in using his gifts and his abilities. So as we begin to pursue God's will and we say, God, what is it you want me to do? We understand that it's good and that his plan overall is this incredible peace, but also that it's something we'll enjoy. And he also says this. He says that it's perfect. See, and I've wrestled with this because how does, why does God say it's good and then he says it's perfect? Well, as you begin to study this, this word, a better word for it is this idea of wholeness. This completeness that in the midst of God's, word, God's will that you will sense 
that you are exactly where you need to be. In fact, it's very similar to what God told in Jeremiah to prosper, the word of shalom. In fact, it's also the same as in Genesis 1.31 when God looked at all his creation. He looked upon it and he said it was very good. It was the way things ought to be. So that is God's will defined. As we begin to figure out what it is I'm supposed to do, now how do I figure it out? Here's what you're looking for. You're looking for a will that, that brings peace. You're looking for, for a God's will that, that will bring, uh, that is good, that is beneficial to His kingdom expansion, that you're looking for something that it brings pleasure as well as something that brings completeness, wholeness to your life. But there's a prerequisite to determining that will that Paul tells us. Right there in verse 1, he says that to know God's will, we must have a transformed life. In other words, we have to acknowledge that we are sinners, that, that we are in a need of a Savior. We must repent of our sins and turn away from our sins and confess that Jesus is Lord. And then you become a new creation. And the heart that Jesus once declared as the source of evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornifications, thefts, false witness, slanders, has now been made new. So in his letter to the Romans, Paul brings to light that necessity for righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ before any transformation can begin. So you want to know what God's will is for your life? Well, first you have to see where, you are, where your standing is with Jesus Christ. God will never reveal it to you if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life to give you that understanding. And you're never going to have the Holy Spirit in your life without knowledge of Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So it always begins and it always has begun with Jesus Christ. If He's not the foundation of your life, well, then you can't move forward. And so we begin... J.A. Packer says that righteousness in its primary meaning signifies personal behavior that is truly admirable and morally purposeful. In other words, do what's right. So as Christians, we've been called uh, into righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ, but it doesn't stop there. We're also called to pursue righteousness. And as we pursue righteousness, we understand that there's this battle for righteousness that exists between that old sinful nature and the new spirit-controlled mind of the believer. Paul speaks to that point that once a believer is new in the Spirit, they're dead to sin. And, and so before coming to faith in, in Christ, the Christian was a slave to sin. But upon profession of faith of Jesus, the Holy Spirit now leads the Christian into righteousness. The believer is no longer mastered by sin, but because of the blood of Christ, they can be a slave to righteousness. You now, with a, through your faith in Jesus Christ, have the ability to choose good to choose what is right. Jesus has given us an example of how to live a righteous life. You just read the Gospels. Pay attention to how Jesus handled adversity and temptation. Look at how he reacted when confronted with grief and anger. Take note to how he responded when he was ridiculed and beaten. We're to look at his example and model our life and the way Jesus lived his so though we are made righteous through faith in Jesus, we're called to pursue righteousness. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.22, says, Now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. We're going to keep coming back to this idea of heart and, 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 and that being the foundation and the core of our relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, look at Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, Paul confesses his, his struggle with sin to the Roman church. Beginning in verse 14, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage of sin. For what I am doing I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. For if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. But no longer, so now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. 
For the good that I want to do, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. For if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but the sin which dwells in me. So I find the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind. And isn't Paul about to tell us to transform our mind in chapter 12? So waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am. Well, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. If you find yourself in that situation, confronted with temptation, confronted with sin, we, sometimes we know what we ought to do and we wrestle with it. Well, I don't really, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't like what's going to happen. Or maybe I do want to do this, and I know God doesn't want me to, but I enjoy it so much. Sometimes we slip and we fall into sin, and we, we, we may uh, let out a, a, a word out of frustration, or, or we tell a quick lie out of response, and immediately there's this guilt that sits in and says, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, or let me correct myself, that wasn't true. But there's other times where we're confronted with the decision that what I'm about to say, what am I about to do, is against the Word of God, yet we continue to do it. And see, my friends, this is the battle of righteousness, that even though that we are made new in Jesus Christ, we still have this old nature. Remember, being a Christian doesn't make us sinless, but it makes us ought to want to sin less. Yeah. And so we, we, we wage this war in our minds and in our hearts. And we become a new creation through faith in Jesus Christ. And all along we're asking, God, what do you want me to do? God, what should I do with my life? But yet we find ourselves in this sinful state. God, what do you want me to do with my life? Well, I'll tell you, God wants you to get your life right. So I want you to pursue righteousness and faith and love and peace from a pure heart. Let's address your heart before we move on to your future. In this case, Paul, he doesn't avoid his personal responsibility to his actions but rather he speaks to that conflict between his desires and of the sin within him. That pursuit of righteousness and the determination of God's will begins with the acknowledgement of Jesus as Messiah and continues with submission to a spirit-controlled life. So I want to know what God's will is for my life. Well, I need to submit to the Word of God. I need to submit unto the Holy Spirit. Now, something very fascinating happens in Joshua's life. If you have your Bibles, look back. I told you we're going, to, we're going to go all kinds of places this morning. Look at Joshua chapter 1, and you'll find that right after De Deuteronomy there in the Old Testament. As you look at Joshua chapter 1, what's happening is um, Moses had led uh, Israel for, for, for many, many years, and, and he had passed away, and, and Israel had found themselves in mourning for 30 days. Now, for over 30 years, Joshua was, was being trained to take over leadership of, of Moses. And uh, he was his, the general of the army. He was a man of great faith. If you remember, Joshua was the one who went to the promised land many years ago and said, we can conquer this. He was one of two. He said, we can do it. While well, the other said, well, no, there's no way. And, and so Joshua was being prepared. But in a lot of ways, Joshua was considered inadequate compared to Moses. Moses is, one of Moses' titles was the servant of the Lord. Well, Joshua is referred to as the servant of Moses. And so 30 days have passed, and Joshua is being prepared to take over the leadership of his nation and, and what I would describe as an almost an insurmountable task of leading millions of people across this river into this promised land. And it wasn't just we're going in and we're planting fields. It is we're going in for battle. God gave us a promise, but we have to work for it. So Joshua is faced with this task, and, and God is beginning to encourage him and tell him what is about to happen. But he tells him this in verse 7 and 8. He says, Only be strong and very courageous. 
Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. See, God's call to Joshua, he told him that the way to prosperity and success was through commitment to the Word of God. But here's the interesting thing, is this word of prosperity, this to be prosperous, was, is different than Jeremiah 29, 11. This prosperity refers to effectiveness. The word success refers to wisdom and intellect, understanding, prudence. And he says, if you want to be a successful leader, if you want to be effective and you want to gain wisdom and you want to gain knowledge and you want, you want to make an impact for my people, then that's only going to come through the Word of God and your commitment to the Word of God. We'll come more to that in a moment. And as you look back at 12, and we don't need to turn there, but we go back to Romans chapter 12. Paul believes that transformation for all believers must occur before, for the renewing of their minds, that study, meditation, prayer, other spiritual disciplines, that's how that, med that's how that transformation begins. So God has called Joshua to be this incredible leader the next leader for a new generation. And the only way he's going to get his wisdom and his intellect is through the Word of God. So my question for you is this, is as we look at our own lives, and as far as I know, there's no one in this room about to lead millions of people into battle. <laughs> but we do feel that the, li that the, lives, the lives we are living, we do face many of our own battles. And sometimes those battles seem insurmountable. And we say, God, what do you want me to do? God, what should I do? But yet we fail to open the Word of God. So here's the thing. In the Old Testament, God spoke in some pretty supernatural ways. He spoke through His voice. He throw, spoke through a waterfall, a still small voice, through His angels, a burning bush, countless different ways that He spoke to His people, dreams and visions and such. But today, his primary way of communication is through his word. And, and, and I know when I, early in my faith, I would go to sleep. And I would say, God, give me a vision. Give me a dream. Speak to me. But I didn't want to open this. Why? Because it took effort. And it was just easier to have him speak to me, to do something supernatural than me to actually put in the effort and the work of opening the word of God and studying it day and night, meditating on it day and night, when that's simply what he has commanded and told Jeremiah to do. What Joshua would it do? Sorry, get my name. My name's wrong. Three things happen in Joshua's life. And this call that God gives him, the first is to listen. He spoke to him. However he spoke to him, we don't know. But he spoke to him. But see, listening is more than just hearing. You want to know what God's will is for your life? We have to listen to God. You know, I'm guilty of this. My wife and I, we work different schedules. She works evenings and different days, and it's never the same. And, and so very often I'll, I'll, I'll find myself at home in the evenings or in the afternoon uh, with the girls, but trying to get work done, uh, whether it's through the ministry or for my schooling or whatever the case may be. And Brooklyn may be home, and, 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 I, and I failed in this, in this sense sometimes because I may be preoccupied with what I'm doing that she may say my name 20 times. Dad, Dad, Dad. Dad, maybe you've, you've had this happen to you too as well. And, and, and there's a point where she, sometimes she'll come and she'll push me a little bit or she'll try to tickle me. Or, or my favorite is when I, maybe I'm watching television and she'll say something three times I don't hear. And she kind of moves her head right into my eyesight. Dad. <laughs> you see, sometimes, as I'm not paying attention, I'm in my own world. I may be irritated. I haven't paid full attention. It isn't until I make that eye contact, until I give her that full attention that she feels like, you know what? Now I can carry on with this question or I can tell my dad this story. As a parent, sometimes we're not amused. Sometimes we're irritated that our children are so rude to interrupt what's going on in our personal time. 
But don't you feel that the child feels something in that same moment? That they have something so important to tell us. They cannot wait to tell you the story or ask you this question. And they've done everything that they can imagine hopes that you'll pay attention to them. And they ask that question. Is, What's so important that my dad doesn't have time for me? You know, I think the same can be said of God. Even though he doesn't speak to us in a supernatural ways as he once did, he still speaks to us through his word. Sometimes we wake up early and we hit the snooze alarm and really we should just wake up and say, you know what, okay, God, you woke me up. Let's spend some time together. Or sometimes we, we, we do find that, that extra 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes where an appointment was canceled or a meeting got let out early. And we're like, oh, great, let me check my Facebook, right? Let me see what's going on in, in my social network. When we should be saying, oh, God, you gave me some time. Let's spend it together. See, we want time with God. We want to spend time with God. And God wants to spend time with you. He wants to speak to you. Yet when we have those opportunities, he's like that little child saying, hey, hey, look, hey, here, hey, I'm right here. And sometimes in our life, it takes that moment when he gets right in our eyesight and says, I'm talking to you. That it takes to get our attention See, the first thing is, you want to know what God's will is, you have to be willing to listen. You have to be pay attention to the time He sets aside for us, because if we're not paying attention to the time He sets aside, He's never going to tell you what His will is for your life. The second is this, is that He gives them this incredible commandment. He says this, He says, Meditate on my word both day and night. I love how J.R. Packer puts this. He says, Meditation is giving it holy thought. Meditation isn't that sitting down, cross-legged, elbows on your knees, fingers together, humming, right? That's, that's not true meditation. Meditation is taking the time to consider and reflect on what God is teaching you, what God has been saying to you in your life. Back in November, I, I began a class for, for, my, for, my, uh, for my doctoral program, and I knew that in this class I was going to be writing a, a major paper on determining the will of God. And so this is where this comes from today. You can thank my seminary for that. <laughs> but simply put, November, December, January, and up till this morning, my study and my time of prayer and my reflection is spent meditating on what is, how do you determine the will of God? See, meditation is something that just happens overnight. Like, okay, let me pray and think about it. But it's one of those things that it takes time, it takes effort to give holy thought, to give consideration my suggestion is you talk to other people. What should I do about this? What would you do? Where is God's counsel in this? So he says you meditate on God's word. And the third charge to Joshua is his ability to allow God's word to define him as the man of God, and as the leader of Israel. See, his commitment to the study of Scripture wasn't about gaining knowledge. Our study of Scripture is never about gaining knowledge. We love those Bible quizzes where we know who you know, so-and-so's father is and how many generations it was, and that's fun. I'm horrible at that. But it's still fun. Our study of the Word of God is about developing a character that is in line with Jesus Christ. It is about transformation. When a Christian makes a pledge to be a student of God's Word, he embarks on a journey of transformation. That you can't be afraid of how your life is going to change because God speaks to you. I know I've shared this in the past. There was a time in my life where, where, where um, early on in my, my, my walk with the Lord, I was um, so excited uh, and I was praying all the time. I was asking God to do these incredible things in the ministry and He would and He answered in such incredible ways that I stopped praying. I was afraid. Like, hey, well, wait a minute, you're, you're actually answering these, these, these prayers and I'm not ready for it. See, we can't be afraid. When we ask God to do something, James says, expect Him to do it. So when we make a commitment to the, be a student of the Word of God, we have to be ready for change. 
We have to be ready for transformation. See, Paul... <clears throat> admits that if it wasn't for the law, he wouldn't have known what sin was. The Word of God. The Word of God tells me what's right and what's wrong. The writer of Hebrews takes it one step further. He says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and quick to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. See, here we are with the heart again. Paul says, Pursue righteousness from a pure heart. The writer of Hebrews says the Word of God will discern the intentions of your heart. See, the Word of God has the ability to reveal a person's thoughts, a person's intentions, and a genuine study of Scripture will not only educate a person to the expectations of God, but will stimulate character change from the inside out. That God promised the people of Israel to place His law in their minds and to write it in their hearts. And it is often the case that when a Christian is faced with temptation, he will know in their mind what to do. It's whether we decide to do it or not will determine our actions. See, the Word of God and the filling of the Holy Spirit are the building blocks of character development which will determine the desires of a man's heart. So J Joshua was faced with that task of leading Israel into the Promised Land. He needed to be an effective leader. He needed wisdom. He needed intellect and knowledge and if he was going to be successful. And God promised that he would. And he promised he would find strength and he would find courage. He would find wisdom and he would find intellect and knowledge and everything he needed in his Word. The same is with us. You want intellect. You want success. You want, you want wisdom. You want courage. It's in the Word. See, God speaks to us through His Word. See, picking up the Bible, looking for a key, few key words because a person is struggling with fear, discouragement, hopelessness. It's okay. It's a temporary fix. It's kind of like replacing a punctured tire with its spare. A spare tire is only sufficient to go so long, to drive so many miles, to go a certain speed. The real way to fix a spare tire, or to a punctured tire, is to replace it completely. And that's what Jesus has done. He's taken our old nature, this old broken nature, this sinful nature, and through His sacrifice and our faith in Him has made us a new creation. And we still fight this battle of righteousness, but Paul says pursue that righteousness. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Allow the Word of God to change you from the inside out. To which God tells Joshua, you meditate on it day and night. You commit to it and you don't turn to the left and you don't turn to the right. But let this be your ever-present guide to understand Understanding my plan and my purpose of prosperity and success for your life. But yet we say, God, what do you want me to do? And the answers are right here. Well, God, I know, but can you send me a text message? Give me an email. Just give me a vision. So here's the thing. God has an incredible plan for our lives. It is a plan of peace and it is a plan of, 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 of goodness, enjoyment, wholeness. But we have to accept that we are still in a pursuit of righteousness. And if we remain in this fallen state, yet we want to serve God, we're not ready our heart needs to be changed. And what I love about this, in James 4, 8, he says, you draw close to God and God will draw close to you. And so we continue to pursue righteousness, to pursue holiness, to be holy as God is holy. And we begin to do that and we continue to do that and we allow the Word of God to transform us, to change us, to give us the wisdom, the intellect, the, the, the discernments that we need to define what our heart is. And what you begin to discover is that your heart no longer is that of the old nature, but your heart has been transformed into the heart of God. And when the psalmist writes, delight yourself in the Lord, for He will give you the desires of your heart, that's what he's talking about. Find peace in the presence of God. Allow Him to define you. And when He defines you, your desires will be the same as His desires. 
So when it comes down to determining, God, what is it you want to do with my life? The answer is very simple. Pursue righteousness. And as long as you are on that pursuit of righteousness, you can do whatever you want. You know, we, we get stuck in this mindset that, well, maybe I'm supposed to be an engineer. Maybe I'm supposed to be a preacher. Maybe I'm supposed to do this. And God has formed one particular career path for my life. One particular person for my life. When God says, you know what, my plan for you is personal. My plan for you is peace. And it is a plan beyond your comprehension. But you need to know my heart first. And when you know my heart, I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. You know, I came across that conclusion, and it was a little hard for me to swallow at first, because I felt like, well, God had a specific plan, a career path, a, uh, and all these things detailed for my life. Now, He knows what they are. That's part of His sovereign will. But He's also given me the freedom to make decisions. And my decisions need to be based on His Word. So the more I dwelled on that and meditated on that, I found liberation I found freedom. There were times in my life where, where I would get a phone call from uh, another pastor and say, hey, why don't you come serve at this church? And I thought, well, maybe that's God's will. But as I began to study, I come to this realization and says, I just don't want to. <laughs> and that's okay. Maybe you get a phone call from a, a coworker. And they say, hey, there's, a, there's another company that's hiring and they're paying much better. You should apply. Well, if you're in the midst of God's will and if you are in the midst of His Word and you're allowing that to determine your decisions, you have the freedom to decide. Lord, is that what you want me to do? Well, you've given me the wisdom to make my own decisions and according to your Word, I will or will not. But here's the thing, our decisions that we make, they can't be based on our sinful desires. They can't be based on our old nature. They have to be grounded and founded on the transformation which Jesus Christ has provided on the cross. And that's where it begins. Always, and always has been, begins with Jesus. Because without that saving knowledge of Him, we don't have the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we don't have understanding of His Word. And without intentional, purposeful study of the Word of God, allowing it to be the foundation, the core of who we are, our heart is still going to be trapped in what Jesus had called adulterous and fornication. It's going to be trapped into deceit. See, God's plan for you is much more fathomable, more incredible than I can even put words to. I know what my boundaries are. I know it's good. I know it's perfect. I know it's pleasing. And I look forward to that. I know his plan for me is one of hope and a future. But I know his greatest desire is for me to know him. His greatest desire is for you to know him. So how do you know the will of God, determine the will of God? Well, it starts with this. So what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you this week to make a commitment to open up the Word of God. That if you find yourself, you wake up a little early this week, don't hit the snooze. Don't take that extra minute to watch 10 minutes extra of the news that morning. Pick up your Bible. If you have a meeting go late or canceled, you find some extra time with the Lord this week, pick up the Word of God. Spend time with Him. Don't just flip around. Don't just say, well, I'm going to read this verse and this passage today. Create a plan. Start with a book. Start with a letter and read it. And when you're done, read it again. And when you finished, read it again. I had a friend of mine. He contacted me this week. He's like, David, I don't know what to do. I'm going through some really hard things right now. My fiance just called off our marriage. I don't know what to do. So I thought God wanted me to do this. I said, well, how much time have you spent in his word lately? He's like, well, I probably haven't read it in six months. Okay. So why don't you start there? And for him, I said, why don't you read James? Let's just deal with that. Okay, what do I do next? I said, well, then you read it again. Okay. I said, it's only five chapters. So then what? I said, well, read it again. Read it every day for a week and then call me. And then we'll talk about it. Okay. God has an incredible plan for our lives. Every one of us. A plan more imaginable than we can ever put words to. But we'll never know it if we don't commit 
to his word. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for, thank you for the promises of your word. Thank you for the call. Thank you for really making it so obvious that you want to speak to us, that you are speaking to us, that, that we just need to take the time and not be lazy, but take the time to open your word, to read, to allow you to speak into our lives, and then to reflect upon that, to give it true, holy thought. Lord, you have a great call and passion for, for this church, and I pray that for this church as well. That as we individually look for the call in our lives and, and how to pursue you with righteousness, that you allow us as a church to reach this community in an incredible way. But it all begins with your word. Don't allow us to put the cart before the horse, Father, but to focus on you first and foremost. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen.